Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesse Chapel, and I'm going to be giving you a presentation today about in pond raceway systems, uh, which is a, a new advanced technology for uh, producing fish in ponds. Now, I want to quickly say here at the front end, this is not designed to give you all the information you need to uh, develop a system at your farm. It's simply designed to give you information about it in general terms so that you can begin to make decisions as to whether you want to learn more detail about this and develop a system ultimately at your operation. So let's go ahead and get started uh, with the presentation. Okay, All right, so when people think of pond culture, this is kind of what they think about. They are thinking about earthen ponds, nets, uh, green water, these kinds of things, aeration machinery, uh, again, this is more of the, the conventional or typical traditional technology. Okay, so when we look at this as a, a demonstration type of thing, we have to assure that a prospective demonstration site has the, the right elements to, that, that can make this happen at your, at your farm. Well, you have to have enough water, enough volume of water to do at least two raceway cells, which, you mean, which means you need 20,000 cubic meters of water. Typically we like to have enough water for three cells because it gives us more economic uh, 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 power. Uh, we have to have con you know, continual access to line power. Electrical energy is, is, is a part of this. So you have to have it. You need access to quality and quantity of the size fingerlings of the right species or, or, or some kind of a comprehensive plan to access these things, even from the, uh, from the size of fry, to get them to the appropriate size to introduce into your grow out system. And of course, you need the, the appropriate amount of capital to make this happen, not just to build the systems and operate it, but you also have to have, to have the money to, to uh, buy the feed and all of those kinds of things and you know, pay, pay your employees. Okay, so uh, this is an, uh, an enhanced pond production technology. And instead of having a still pond, a static pond environment, it uses a constant flowing water principle. This is the main difference you need to take home today and how we do it within, a, within, a earth, within an earthen pond environment is what this presentation really is about. You can see the pictures there, the raceways are where we hold the fish, but, but what's different is how we manage the water in the open water as well as passing through the raceways. This is not just about producing X number of kilos in the raceways, it's how we manage the water. And by, by that, I mean, we use a flowing water principle. Can't overemphasize that it is a robust, flow of water around and around the pond. And we use what's called white water units, which is the, the drivers to achieve that flow through the raceways and also around the pond from points that we establish in the pond with additional uh, white water units. Now, this technology is not particularly new. We've been working on it for more than 25 years as, as, as from a research standpoint, as well as applications from many farms uh, all over the world. And we'll teach you these approaches today so that you can uh, make wise investments and make this in pond raceway system work, but it depends on following the principles that make this work. Just like riding a bike, you can't ride a bike by backwards, at least not very far. So you have to follow the principles. You have to keep your eyes open riding that bike. You have to ride it frontward. You have to ride it pedaling. So these are the principles that make you able to ride a bike. Well, this system is no different, but we'll teach you the principles that make it work for you and be, be far more productive than a traditional or typical uh, pond. Uh, in fact, uh, 250 to 300% better uh, yields, but you have to follow the principles. If you follow these principles, you're going to be successful. And, and, the, and the performance that we state, uh, you will be able to achieve. If you don't follow the principles, your performance will, will suffer and you will probably not make money. Okay, so this is, this is a way to make money in an earthen pond 
more so than what you can get from a traditionally managed or traditionally uh, operated pond system. Now, when we think about how we do this and how many raceways we are able to establish in a pond and that kind of thing, it's based on the volume of the pond water. It's based on the volume of the pond water. So for every 10,000 cubic meters of water you have, you can establish and install one raceway of our standard commercial size. It's 220 cubic meters, okay, in volume in that raceway. And that actually constitutes about 2% of the overall of that 10,000 cubic meter of volume, okay? The raceway cell is 22 meters long, five meters wide, and the effective working depth is two meters. The water depth in the raceway, we try to hold at two meters. System is very, very flexible. It can culture multiple different species or sizes of those species in these units. And because the fish are in a confined area, the waste collection is not just possible, it's, it's uh, becoming easier as we, as we uh, develop that part of the technology. Now, as I say, while we are holding the fish in the raceway, we culture them in the raceway, the real difference in this approach to traditional pond culture is the way we manage the water by mixing and aerating it through the open pond around and around. This should be your main takeaway today anything you take away here today this is this is it okay so this is a flowing water culture system that we establish in an earthen pond now minimum size is 10,000 cubic meters but from an economic standpoint we we try we say okay 20,000 uh, meters you can establish two raceways but really for most places and this is not true everywhere with every species well, for most pl most places, you want to probably have 30,000 cubic meters and establish three raceways in that. You can do it with two, but here again, it depends on the species and where you are and what kind of uh, margin you are able to get, you know, for the fish you sell. Now, these systems require electrical service 100% of the time, okay? If the power goes off for, for a few minutes, that's not a problem but we have to have electrical backup service with uh, uh, generators uh, that will start automatically. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And these are only suited, this system is only suited for a high quality floating feed. We don't use any sinking, feed, sinking feeds or any feed supplements such as chopped grass or any other ag byproducts in, in this approach. Only for high quality feeds and, and you're able to get very, very efficient feed conversion ratios uh, using this system. Now, it requires you to adhere to these principles, okay? Make no mistake, this is a principle-driven technology and re it requires you to be careful about it. A new system with a specific design and management requirements are what this is. And it's because it's a significant investment including your operating capital, you don't want to make errors here because they're very costly. And we're talking about specific equipment that you can't typically go just buy at a hardware store. Uh, and these also include backup units for these blowers that, uh, that you need to have at the farm. Not You don't need to go somewhere and find it. You need to have it at the farm. Now, here's a simple sketch of a, just a basic in pond raceway system uh, pond. Okay, you can see the perimeter levee, the green is representing the perimeter levee and the arrows are showing you how we how the system pushes the water around and around the pond. Okay, now on the far on the right side, lower, lower right, you see two raceways. And under that you see we're because you have two raceways, you can assume there's at least 20,000 cubic meters of of volume in this pond, and that's uh, in the graphic in the center. Now, on the left side, at the very very top, you can see a white water unit there. If you can see my cursor, and down at the lower left, you can see another white water unit there, helping to push this water around and around in more or less a circular pattern around the pond. Now, this diagonal uh, uh, element 
is what we call the baffle. And it makes the water take the long course around the pond and not just come out of the unit and short circuit and come back into the, into the, uh, the head end of the, of the uh, raceways. This is a very critical, one of the critical principles. You have to have a, uh, a, a baffle installed correctly. Okay, here's a little bit of an animation that you can, that you can see that shows you how this operates and, and kind of a, and kind of a moving, uh, moving animation here. So you see the water's coming into the raceways at the head end there, and it passes through the raceways through this area on the downstream end of the raceways, what we call a quiescent zone. You can see the red bar there that's representing a manure removal uh, machine that on periodically during the day, it will oscillate back and forth once or twice as, it, uh, as the manure is collected in this quiescent zone. Now the water passes out of the raceway and continues around the pond. You can see the, the blue green blocks uh, represent the white water units. We call them WWU and they push the water around the pond. Now you can see also the baffle wall is represented by the red bar uh, there. So you can see how this operates and it operates 24 hours a day. We don't turn this off. It's, it operates continually uh, like just like a river flowing down, you know, from, from the mountain, for example. Okay. Okay. Enough, enough about that. All right. Now, as I was saying a while ago, pond water volume is everything to this system. The more water volume you have, the more production power you have. And when we're setting up this kind of uh, uh, a system, uh, larger ponds are far more efficient than many smaller ones. So instead of having five or six small ponds with uh, with systems in them, it's better to, to combine those ponds into a single unit. It's far more economically desirable for you to do that, all right? And we have some established techniques for combining ponds without having to haul the, haul the uh, entire levee uh, away. We, we, we can show you how to do that, that uh, where, where it keeps your cost uh, to a minimum. Now, the heart of this system is what we call the floating white water unit, all right? I think you can see there on the picture on the, on, the, on the left side, it is a very specific design. It is floating. Uh, some people use fixed ones, but we, that's, not our, that's not our standard. We use floating units so that as water, as water elevation or the surface uh, elevation varies after a big rains or whatnot, the unit floats up and down and, and keeps its uh, per, uh, particular orientation uh, uh, that we want. Now, all of those white water, white water units are all identical so that they are interchangeable in the event that you have a problem, okay? There are no moving parts in this whole system except the blower, and it's sitting under the little hood there, the little white uh, uh, shroud there over the top. The blower is underneath that. Each one of them has a has a uh, regenerative blower, all right? Okay, let's go on to the next one. Now here you see a pond that's obviously not been filled yet, but you see the floating units there sitting on the pond bottom waiting for the water to, to be uh, 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 pumped in. You can see the, on top of this one, it's a, it's a yellow cover ab above the, the, bl the blower. The white thing you see there is the filter that keeps the bugs and other debris out of the blower and out of your out of your diffuser equipment. Very, very important. Very important to service that thing, meaning you have to clean the bugs out of it uh, every uh, two or three weeks. Okay, I think this is a little bit of a video that you can see. Uh, it will operate here. Yeah, uh, and you can see the pace of the water flow coming out from under these floating units as they pass through the very upstream gate. Now the, the gate, the confining gate for the fish you see right here, if you can see my cursor, is uh, just a few inches from the lip of the, of, the, uh, of the white water unit. You can see it all the way across. Every unit has one that confines the fish in the unit. Now there's, a, as, there's an identical one down on the lower end of the, of the white water, of the uh, raceway rather, uh, that confines the fish and keeps them in the raceway all the time. They're not released into the pond. 
They're only fed and they're only housed in the raceway itself. Okay. All right, here's another little bit of a video that shows you the water flow. And this one, the farmer has two, two gates in place. The, the first gate the, with the bigger mesh is the one that he will leave in, in place pretty much the whole time. The smaller mesh is because the fish uh, are small and he thought it would be better to have them uh, behind this gate rather than the bigger mesh uh, uh, until they are grow, grow a little, grown a little bit uh, uh, to a larger size and wouldn't be uh, having a problem and some of them may be escaping through the larger mesh there. Okay. Now, as I said a moment ago, this system has been worked on for more than 25 years. There's a lot of details in this, and this is why I said earlier, you're not gonna be able to get all the details in this, in this presentation. Uh, we can provide them for you, but uh, this, this one is, this presentation is, you're not gonna be able to get that because it's only limited to an hour, a little bit more. Uh, there's a lot of key calculations that are used in this to expect that, uh, the, to achieve the expected results, okay? There's no point in you rediscovering all this yourself. It's already been done. So if you operate according to what we teach you, um, this, this operates very, very predictably and highly efficiently uh, as a production system. Now, when we get back to looking at pond volume and the number of, of, of raceways to be installed, obviously you need to know what the pond volume is. That is the length, the width, and the depth uh, multiplied together. And I can tell you from a lot of experience, and a lot of, a lot of you have the same experience, uh, there's a big difference between what the bottom profile or the, the depth profile looks like, you know, six months after a, a brand new pond is built, certainly if it's been uh, in, in play for several years, uh, the pond is typically not as deep as it was when it was originally constructed, especially if it's been operated with traditional uh, uh, approaches. So once we calculate the pond de uh, volume, then we can, can determine the number of raceways. Okay, don't overbuild raceways more than what your pond volume will indicate. Please don't do that because if you do, it's gonna cost you a lot of money and a lot of problems. Only put in one raceway for each 10,000 cubic meters of water, okay? So in this calculation, uh, you can see the the area of the raceway itself is only about 2.2% of, uh, of, the, of the volume of the pond, okay? The preference, a standard cell, as I was saying a while ago, is 22 meters by five meters by two meters deep. That's 20, 220 cubic meters within the raceway in the production area, we call it. Now, that means you need to have 10,000 cubic meters of pond water. If you put in two cells, which again is the very basic minimum, you need to have 20,000 cubic meters of, of water in that pond. Okay, and that will accommodate 440 cubic meters of production area or production volume. Now, when we talk about how much production that will support, so that means 10,000 cubic meters of pond volume can support what we are, what we uh, target in these raceways of the fed species. We, we know that we can get 33 tons per cycle of the fed species. We can also get seven and a half tons of what we call service species or filtering fish in the open water areas. They are not fed. They only graze on the phytoplankton and, and zooplankton and other biota within the system. But so that the way we manage the system, you can get that production for each 10,000 cubic meters of pond volume. Okay, now that's at peak biomass. All right, so that means when you reach that peak biomass, those fish need to be sold. Now, if you have, uh, like we teach, we, we, let's say you have three cells in the pond, we, we stock them and operate this in a staggered fashion. So whenever the first group is ready to harvest, 
the second pond, second raceway and the third raceway are behind them each by let's say 45 to 50 days. So you have a continual production coming out of your farm or that pond uh, that uh, all of them aren't ready to harvest all at the same time. This is a, an important principle uh, for, for this, that actual biomass should never exceed the peak biomass as we calculate for the system at, at any time. Okay, now this raises the limits of the typical pond production without water exchange. In fact, we don't want you to do any water exchange with this technology because of the way we manage the system. The system and the, and the biota within it, we have harnessed and make it operate you know, for us. Now, as I was saying earlier, it requires reliable electrical service, line power, but also with a backup generator system. The pond uh, configuration volume uh, is all based on, on, uh, on, on that pond volume. Again, one, one uh, uh, raceway unit for each 10,000 cubic meters. I know you hear me say this over and over again, but there's a reason for that. And uh, the reason is sometimes people want to put in three or four raceways when they only have the pond volume for one and it, it, mess, it, it costs them a lot of money. Okay, mixing that full pond volume is critical in this management. This is what's different about this system. Now, when we match up the air blowers with the air needed for the floating units, uh, these are some numbers here that you can, you can look at, but I would encourage you uh, to don't, don't go build this stuff yourself. There's a, there's a couple of vendors out there, one in particular that you can buy the units cheaper than you can uh, learn all the intricacies of how to, how to build these things. But typically the blower needs to be able to put out a, about 170 cubic meters of air per hour at the immersion depth, which is about a meter and uh, maybe as much as a meter two underwater. And all of these blowers output varies with the type and the immersion depth and the diffuser tubes that we use. Now, for each white water unit or each pond with, with one raceway, we have, we have uh, one blower on the raceway white water unit itself. We have one blower on the associated uh, uh, a white water unit that we establish in the open pond to help with water movement. And then we have at least one blower a supplementary uh, for a, a supplementary aeration and, and a, an additional one in storage for backup. So if you have one raceway, you need to purchase four blowers. Now, when you put in two raceways, three raceways, four raceways, uh, yes, you need additional blowers, but you typically only have one, maybe two uh, 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 spare blowers in the in the shed, so that at any if any time one of them fails, you can uh, readily replace it. Okay, so we say the white water system is really the heart of this of this uh, uh, approach, this technology. That the heart of the system is the white water unit. All right. Um, and they are standard production tools. The diffuser tubes are a certain type. There, they are many different knockoffs out there in the world now. Don't be fooled and to buy in one of those that, oh, it's, it's a lot cheaper and it puts out, oh, no. don't do that because we don't know what the performance is. If you know what the performance is and you've gone to the, to the effort and expense of, of determining, determining that, Okay, but most people have not. And in fact, what we find is even though the, these knockoff diffusers put out bubbles, uh, they are either, the bubbles are either way too large or they're way too small and it doesn't meet the standard of what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to achieve aeration, but also a, a strong water drive to push the water through the raceways around and around the pond, all right? The diffusers are, are located in, on a manifold underneath the hood, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, uh, every six or seven centimeters on center, and at least two diffuser racks, we, we actually use four now under that hood. They need to be easily removable for cleaning, and the hood angle that, that uh, 
uh, confines the energy until it escapes from under the under the thing. It needs to be about 35 degrees. And we just use a straight uh, angle. Some of the ones that we developed early on had curved hoods and you don't, you don't need to do this. We found that you don't need to do this. Okay, here's a little bit of a video that shows you how this, how this works. And it's a side view of a white water unit that we're looking at the side of it underwater. You see the diffuser grid uh, down at the bottom that has, has some bubbles sitting on top. And uh, you def the deflector hood that I was telling you about, it needs to be about 35 degrees or so. All right, now you can see the, 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 the structure there to the right of the unit is the, is the raceway itself. You see the knee wall, which keeps the water from pulling back from the raceway, coming backwards from the raceway and coming up under the, the hood there, the, the white water unit. We don't want that at all. Now you see the confinement gate there is uh, represented by that crosshatched bar. And then uh, uh, that's the raceway wall, the, the blue uh, structure there. Okay, let's, uh, let's start the, the bubbles rolling and we'll go through this fairly quickly. There's no point in uh, belaboring it. You guys get it very quickly. As the bubbles start to rise in under the white water unit hood, they start to pull water. This is nothing more than a giant air lift. Okay, the bubbles are provided by the blower down coming to the manifold down underwater. And as they rise and, and start to accelerate the water movement, it pulls water from the pond and around, around the pond. Oh, let me go back. Uh, and of course, you can see the fish there in the raceway unit itself. Okay. Okay, let's look to the next slide here. You see uh, on the far right, you see the white water unit pulling water in, pushing it through the raceway, what we call a production zone, the 22 meter production zone. And then it passes out to the, to the left through the quiescent zone. Now, we, we originally used a three meter quiescent zone, but we found that if we added another three meter segment, which to, in total is six meters there, we have very, uh, an increased uh, ability to harvest the manure solids or other organic solids from the, from the pond in the quiescent zone, from the, from the bottom of the quiescent zone, okay? The confinement gates, you remember, you can see the one on the upstream end sitting on the knee wall there. And then the other one down at the downstream end of the production zone. And then another, another unit, another uh, uh, confinement gate, actually it's, it's an exclusion gate to keep the uh, fish that are in the open water, the filtering species from disturbing the uh, material settling in the bottom of the quiescent zone. All right, now with using the white water unit, we use it to create the flow of water. It also moves the waste solids down to the uh, uh, co collection area we call the quiescent zone. These, are, these units are operated electrically and they're continually uh, operated to, to mix the pond production both vertically and horizontally. No other aeration equipment should be used in these ponds at any time, even paddle wheels or injection systems, all that stuff. You don't need to use that using this approach. The white water unit are all you need to correctly mix and move the water for optimal results. Okay. Now the correct ratio uh, here, as I was saying a while ago, if you have um, uh, each, each production cell, you have two white water units, one attached to the cell, one in the open water. I know I'm being a little bit redundant here, but it's, it's important. If a pond is more than three meters deep, we give a little bit of a different uh, uh, addition here with a mixing chimney, which we can use a white water unit for the same, uh, same thing, or we can use a mixing chimney that you see depicted there on the right side of this, this uh, slide, okay? And all that is is a chimney, an airlift that mixes the water vertically, brings water up uh, from three meters or, more, or even deeper uh, to um, to uh, bring it out and onto the surface. So we want the oxygen level, the dissolved oxygen to be the same reading at the surface as it is at the bottom. And that way we can process the waste load produced by the 
the fish and the biota that's created by the waste stream of the fish, we can uh, process that in real time and you know, in, you know, at concurrently as the production uh, uh, volume or the biomass rises. We're not creating a lag there in production in, uh, in assimilation of the waste load. A part of this uh, white water unit, the critical thing is this diffuser. It's marketed by a company uh, that's uh, the, it's marketed as AeroTube. It is a highly efficient, consistent uh, uh, aeration tubing that allows you to get the most out of the blowers and the most out of the energy that you spend, expend uh, and uh, pay for in, in, in your electrical bill, all right? Very, very important that you use the correct one. There are knockoffs out there aplenty. Some of them have a uh, blue, blue stripe like you see on this picture that I'm holding there. Uh, some of them have two blue stripes. Some of them have a red stripe. Some of them have a yellow stripe. Do yourself a favor. Don't experiment around with this. This is too expensive to be playing around with different types of, uh, of, of aeration uh, tubing. AeroTube is the type that we developed this technology around because it is so, so highly efficient. Uh, I'm not on their payroll. I'm, so the, you, they're, they're producing this and market it uh, globally. Now this blower is a typical type blower we use. It's called a regenerative blower. The one that we developed most of this off of, off is called a white water, a, a, sorry, a, a sweet water unit it's built by a company called GAST, G-A-S-T. Uh, they're they're assembled, built and assembled in di different places in the world, and they are highly reliable. When you when you uh, are powered up electrically, if it operates at all, and, and they usually do, um, it will operate for many many years with you know continual service to you. Now, typically, if we if we say we want, uh, we expect this to produce, uh, uh, let's say uh, 300 CFM of, uh, of air. Uh, great, well, we want this blower, we will, we'll select a blower that will at 70% capacity do the job. We don't want it to be up against the wall all the time uh, with the production output. So we, we, we size it at 70% of what we need on the on the white water unit itself okay it's high volume air with relatively low pressure highly reliable tool all right this is a kind of a sketch of the the uh, hood and all of the white water unit you can see this is a little bit older picture here and you can see we use two uh diffusers under this these are some of the ones that we built orig <coughs> originally excuse me <coughs> Now we use, instead of using two uh, diffuser uh, racks, we use four. And that way they're easily easily pulled out, uh, washed with a pressure washer, and then reinserted uh, you know, in, in the next one. Actually, we just swap units. So, so this, this particular uh, device is not, is not uh, uh, down for any length of time. Again, this is five meters wide and uh, it operates at about 100, uh, 70 cubic meters of air per hour at that depth, which is right about a meter. Okay, here's a one and a half horsepower white water unit, a floating unit that we, we I showed you this picture a little bit ago. In places where, you, where your electricity is 50 hertz, uh, you need to use, be sure to use a 2.2 horsepower because at 50 hertz, you're not getting the performance that you get if you're operating this at 60 hertz. Very, very important to know what type of electricity you have. Okay, very, very important. Okay, here's a picture of the diffuser rack and a C-clamp there to hold it in place. When we get ready to, to, uh, to uh, slide it out to, to uh, clean it, that we can push it right back into that C-clamp rack and, uh, and uh, ready to go again. Now you can see the diffusers there on the right side. They're installed, like I say, on about six or seven centimeter centers, and uh, they are installed tight. They're not they're not slack. They don't have 
extra length there. So it's very important that you get these get these uh, installed at, that are that are where they're tightly uh, stretched across it. Okay, this is a rear uh, of the diffuser rack with a easily removable uh, uh, rack. Uh, you can see the way we lock them in there with these little uh, little uh, C clamp uh, deals. What do you see? What do you see wrong with this one on the left? Well, this one I say wrong. Uh, this this grower wanted to do it this way, uh, it, but it's not according to the standard. It doesn't have flotation, so its position is fixed no matter what kind of rain he has. <laughs> now, mind you, I'll go back. Uh, this is in an area in Vietnam where it's not unusual to have uh, 20 centimeter, maybe even 30 centimeter rain. So he has to have a way to get rid of that water out of the pond so his, his unit is not uh, 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 functioning poorly. Okay, this is a little bit of a, a sketch up design for one of the systems that was installed in Vietnam. Uh, you can see the raceways we're looking uh, uh, downstream, if you will, you can see the the system down there on the on the on the left raceway is the manure removal device, the solids. You can see the supplemental air tube uh, uh, slots on the top of the walls. Okay, here we're uh, looking from above, so to speak, at the white water units, which is the in, entrance end. All right, you see the air blowers there on the situated on the sides of the wall. The the white water unit there, the the diffuser racks uh, underneath. Okay, you see the working walkway across the top there, where you can get out and feed the fish or take care of managing your system. Okay, here we're inside the raceway. We don't, obviously there's no water in it, but we see the upstream confinement gate. You see the, when you're looking through the gate, you can see the uh, the white water unit. You can see the, the the upstream knee wall, which is in this case, it's approximately 80 centimeters tall. Uh, uh, there's the confinement gate there and you see the slots for the, the supplemental air that's used in the system. Once your biomass, it has reached about 60% of your target biomass, we we use additional uh, aeration there to, uh, it's just an insurance policy for, for the fish. Now, the raceway location and construction, I will say it's very important to locate the raceways that facilitate, where they facilitate the greatest efficient water flow and access for stocking and feeding and harvesting and all the general management. So you don't wanna put the raceways on the back of the pond where you have very poor access to it. And generally speaking, their raceways are constructed of, well, several materials. I'll show you, I'll show you some, but typically brick, concrete, and, and steel uh, reinforcing uh, uh, bars are used as typical uh, uh, components to the construction. The raceways typically have a floor that's two parts. One is the footer, which is right under the raceway wall that supports the weight of the wall but also the floor that's, uh, that's between the walls, if you will, that forms the floor of the raceway. And typically it's only seven or eight, eight centimeters thick. It's not a load bearing surface at all. Okay, here's a picture of uh, raceway being constructed. This particular one is uh, being built in China. You can see the brick uh, wall construction. That's actually two, brick, two thicknesses. I'll show you a picture in a moment you can see but I wanted to show you the concrete footer under the wall to support the weight of the wall in, on a somewhat soft pond bottom. Okay, here you see the, uh, the uh, rebar construction reinforcing steel uh, that's, that's uh, installed on about a three meter, maybe four meter uh, space. You can see in this one, in this previous picture, you can see them along the, the length of the wall. Okay, here is a good picture of a finished raceway. You can, you can actually see the, um, the uh, uh, concrete piers in the wall that's been poured around the rebar. You can see the nice smooth finish to the, to the raceway bottom. 
You see the slots in the top to accommodate the uh, supplemental air tubing. And no down on the back end, you can see the knee wall on the downstream end of the quiescent zone. This is the quiescent zone back here at the very back of the raceway. Now let's look at another picture here of the same, same system. We can see it in a look from a different angle. Uh, this is a little bit earlier in the construction, but you can see the raceways there and you can see the, 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 the knee wall there on the back side of the, on the downstream side of the, of the raceway. Now, as I was saying earlier, if you look at this overall length, the unit that we, the, the part that we put the white water unit, the wall, it's about two meters long. We slide the white water unit in there and it's floating, remember? And then the production cell, the production area, if you will, or cell is 22 meters long. And then the quiescent zone is an additional six meters long, okay? So the way my math works is that is a total of 30 meters, all right, 30 meters. And the water passes through, through the quiescent zone, drops the solids in the quiescent zone and passes out and goes on around the pond. We install working walkways on the top of the raceway on the upstream end, as well as on the downstream end. We make sure that we don't install them over the confining gates where we're confining the fish because we need to service the gates. We, we occasionally need to, to get, uh, get the, um, uh, debris that's collected on the surface of the, of the, of the, of the gate out with a brush. Now, <clears throat> sometimes growers will put this device, this, this uh, walkway over the top of the white water unit. Now, remember, you still have to maintain the white water unit, but they do this so that they can harvest more easily. And this, uh, this, this walkway uh, system is not in the way, all right? Now, typically the width of these things are about one, 1 1.2 meters wide and they need to be strong enough for, you know, delivering feed out onto the unit. Typically guys will use carts or, or that kind of thing, but they, they don't need to be an impediment to the raising and lowering of these upstream uh, gates, as I was saying. Now, most of the utility hookups are on the upstream end because that's where most of our electrical equipment is operated. All right, now, so on the downstream end, we are operating typically only the, the waste collection device, which is, doesn't require nearly as much electrical uh, equipment. Now, by the way, let me mention here, this electricity working around water, you need to be careful. Uh, it needs to be, the electrical gear needs to be installed correctly. And if it is installed correctly, there is no problem with it at all. But just rest assured, electricity and water will still kill you. So let's install this correctly uh, and uh, not have, have, a, have a, a short circuiting going on any place to create a problem for any of the personnel or, or, uh, or uh, interruption of the use of the unit. Now, as I said earlier, electrical power is required, but we have to have a backup system, an auto start backup system generator. Now, Typically, uh, the best ones that will start most reliably are LP fired or, or uh, even, even uh, gasoline fired. Ones that are diesel, oops, ones that are diesel or, um, or, or other fuels, uh, there are some other fuels that you can use, are typically not as easily or more as reliably started. But anyway, that generator needs to be tested under full load at least every week. Don't, don't let it sit there and, and it'll have a startup uh, program, but it's typically started to make sure that it will start up. You need to make it start with a, a load or under full load, not, not just start up. And I, I tell guys, look, you know, set up fire drills so that guys can see how this is operated during daylight hours so that they understand exactly what needs to be done when they're not under stress. Uh, at night, typically this stuff is two or three o'clock in the morning when that power is interrupted. And uh, you know you don't want to have that experience for the first time in the dark. Okay, so 
do it in the daytime, have these fire drills in the daytime uh, so that uh, your uh, personnel are prepared. All right, here's a good picture of a backup generator. One of the, as I say, the critical uh, uh, elements here, critical to the overall success of your operation. Now the confinement gates, as we, we use them to hold the fish in the raceway. There's one on each end. And typically the frame should be made from four or five centimeter aluminum or steel. Typically we don't recommend wood because it gets too heavy. The mesh can be PVC coated metal or PVC coated steel or stainless mesh of the appropriate size. Now you wanna have the mesh sized so that two things. Number one thing, the fish can't, none of the smallest fish can't escape, but also it shouldn't significantly reduce the water flow. We don't you want to use a mesh that's so small the water won't flow through this unit. That's a big problem. And typically we have the gates mounted into slots in the raceway wall. Typically about, we have two slots, 10 to 20, maybe 30 centimeters apart to allow easy access and exchange of these gate panels if we need to service them or change the, change the gate because the mesh size is, is now too small. Now, Gates keep your fish in and allow the water uh, to flow through, but they also keep the other fish from the outside that are in the open water. We exclude them from the quiescent zone. You can see this picture is actually <coughs> a picture of the quiescent zone. Okay. Now this is a good shot of metal gates uh, that are used in uh, these particular ones we, uh, are being used in China. Very efficient, allow the water to flow right through the gate with, without any issue. Now you, you saw that uh, video a little bit of a go. Now the supplementary air systems, typically we only operate those things, an, an additional, that additional blower, when the system has reached at least 60% of its target biomass. Now we remember the unit is 20 meter, 22 meters long but we only use that, those diffusers in the first 15 meters of the raceway, not all the way to the end, or it will disrupt the collection uh, of the waste particles in the, in the quiescent zone, all right? I think I have a picture of how this uh, operates in just a minute, but the diffuser tubes for the supplementary air is, is affixed at the base of the sidewall. Don't put it out in the, in the middle of the raceway at all because it disrupts the flow. If you, you know, if you see this picture, just ensure that they are installed correctly. <coughs> okay. All right, this is the blower that's operating the supplementary air uh, system. Here's uh, this, this particular wall has a diffuser, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, um, the uh, air delivery tubes in a single slot. You can use two slots if you want. But one of the points here, you can see the, the little ball valves that turn on and off the airflow. You wanna install a, a good quality valve because this particular one, uh, I remember, wasn't, uh, didn't have included in the plastic UV uh, uh, protectors. And so after about a year, uh, these things became very brittle and eventually failed. Uh, but uh, use, use a good quality uh, uh, ball valve there or valve so that uh, sunlight uh, doesn't create a problem for you. I think this is a little bit of a video here. Um, you can see. Now, you can see this particular system, uh, they're just showing us how it operates. The, the biomass is not such that. This is the first time. Uh, hold on, let's see if I can. Let me let me show. You. Oh. <laughs> the uh, the biomass is not such that they even need to operate. It. But this is a species that doesn't come to the surface too much. Uh, this is called snakehead. Uh, but, uh, but this is um, a system that. Uh, let that me, is the supplementary air the system that we have put. installed in our system in China. This is the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, the baffle. It's very important that it's oriented in the correct way and doesn't 
extend too far uh, to uh, any any uh, surrounding uh, levy. Okay. Now, all it is is a device that makes the water take the long course around, and we're able to get all of the water in the pond system working for us. Okay. Now, in 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 the way we design these, the end of that baffle doesn't need to come anywhere closer than two to 300% of the total width of the raceways to the nearest uh, levee. So for example, if you have three raceways, their total width, if they're five by five, 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 so they are a total of 15 meters, we wanna try to make sure that we're either 30 meters or as much as 45 meters away from the nearest levee. Now, you wouldn't think that would make much of a difference, but trust me, it makes a huge difference with the efficiency of the water flow around the pond. All right. And there's a difference there, the 200 to 300%, uh, there's, there's, there's a reason for that spread that we can go over at a, at a later time, but the, the length of your baffle is important. Now, this is one of the original baffles we built here with uh, some systems we installed here in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, this is made from a nylon, a very heavy duty nylon fabric that actually it's used to separate in a paper, paper mill, it separates the paper fiber <coughs> from the uh, uh, liquid. And it's very, very durable. It's been in place since 2007, you can see on the uh, lower right still operating just like it was installed uh, today in, in 2021. Now you can see in this particular application, the guy used uh, some orange uh, plastic. Now for my estimation, that material is too lightweight. This guy is trying to do things uh, too cheaply and this is gonna fail, but that's, I wanted to show you that and really what not to do. There's also another uh, part of this that I would show you what not to do. You can see all this vegetation in the pond bottom. That's got to be oxidized, meaning it has to be rotted, which is going to use up a lot of the oxygen for the first several weeks, if not a couple of months in the pond. Very important that you get that vegetation out before the pond is flooded. This fellow's kind of a little bit ahead of himself uh, with the flood up. Okay, now we want to make sure that the pond bottom should be regularly shaped so that allows efficient water mixing and, and flow around and around the pond. That baffle, as I say, shouldn't be restrictive and uh, make sure that it's appropriate distance from any, any of the levees that it's aimed at. Now the raceways, when they're set up, the water exchange uh, should occur about every five to seven minutes. So the water volume in these raceways are being exchanged in no more than eight minutes, okay? So it passes through pretty quickly. So therefore, a, a, a raceway unit that's got two, 220 cubic meters, it exchanges its volume eight or nine times per hour. Now, when you do the math, that means each raceway will have more than 50,000 cubic meters of water passing through it each day. That's very, very powerful. Now you think, well, that might be too much flow for let's say young fish. It is not. That, that flow, it's about, oh, let's say uh, eight, seven, six to eight, maybe, maybe as much as nine centimeters per second, but typically we target eight centimeters per second as the, as the flow rate, all right? Now let's talk a little bit about uh, removal of the waste I'll go through this uh, pretty quickly. I don't want to get into too many details here, but uh, the pond acts as a biological filter for this system. And we want to keep it aerobic <clears throat> as we possibly can by mixing it top to bottom. And, uh, but we also know that at the quiescent zone, we can collect and remove a lot of the organic material that is uh, you know, developed and collected in the pond. We know it's collectible. We have collected it. And some of the tools that we use uh, are, are still developing, but uh, they, they are 
uh, able to reduce to reduce the 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 uh, waste load on the pond by removing that those that organic material. So it it relieves some of the uh, 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 oxygen requirements, if you will, and other biota that are required in any pond to assimilate this waste load. Okay. Now the waste from this amount of fish uh, from a 22 meter standard uh, standard uh, uh, unit, we use that last six meters to develop that quiescent zone where we harvest the solids. Now you can do it manually, but typically mechanized systems uh, are better and we have been developed and a lot, really are the most commonly used today. We typically operate those three, maybe four times a day. It's not operated continually at all. It can be driven by a pump or an airlift system. And we have a receiving area on shore for the waste material. And we don't want to have any of that coming back into the pond or even any water that's uh, being uh, passed over the top of it, so to speak. So we wanna, when we remove it from the pond, we don't want any leachate uh, coming back into the pond unit. That, that uh, material is a high grade, actually it's a quite a useful fertilizer for a wide variety of crops. Here you can see guys installing a, 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 a six meter, meaning two uh, vacuum heads in that system. The two pumps, we use what we call mud hog pumps. They're, semi, they're called semi-solids pumps. You can see the suction head on the bottom. And once they're in place, they're drawn back and forth with a cable, uh, just like uh, it operates just like a, um, a, a garage door system. Okay, here you can see the quiescent zone with the two, two uh, parts. You can see on the left side there, you can see the two slots for the downstream gate for the confi confinement gates for the fish. You see similarly on the outside of the quiescent zone to keep exclude the fish from getting into the quiescent zone. Now this one right here, this is also a knee wall within this, within this system that keeps the two uh, vacuum heads from getting tangled up. Okay, just a quick sketch of this. The water flows down the raceway and is collected in the quiescent zone, all right? This one shows only a three meter uh, quiescent zone, but you, you get you get the idea. Okay, here's a little bit of an up uh, you know up, uh, up close view. We have cables that that pull the unit back and forth, and like I say, a cycle that we use tw tw three times, maybe four times a day. It goes down and back, down and back, and that is a cycle. Okay, then it sits and, and waits for the next programmed. Uh, event to, to harvest the solids from the floor. Now, you might be curious as to what's under this system. I'll show you that in a minute, minute to help, help do that. But this one is a waste system controlled by a computer, it operates very, very efficiently, picks up the solids from the floor of the quiescent zone and pumps them over into the trough that you see there on the right. Okay. By the way, that was a that was a, a original three meter wide system. Okay, here this one is a six meter wide system. You can see the two pumps. <clears throat> and the way this one works is this this carriage is pulled back and forth on the system. They're they're not stationary. Some others are stationary, but again, this is something that you don't need to build yourself. The uh, fabricator guys, we, and we've trained uh, a couple of them. They're, they're very, very skilled at developing this and can do it much cheaper than you can. Okay, this is a double system. They're pumping into a single trough. Again, it's six meters wide. To the right, you can see the confinement gates on the downstream end of the, of the raceways. Okay, here are the, the, where the sedimentation uh, it's coming into the shore, shore based uh, tanks. We used to use two receiving tanks. Now we've gone to three. You can see this construction here uh, where there's three, three uh, tanks uh, being, being used. This one in the, in the background, so to speak, is a two, two uh, segment system. You can see the water coming in on the lower left. 
it settles in this larger tank, it overflows a weir, you can see it here in the background, and then it goes out, in this particular case, it goes out to a, to a plant growing area on this particular farm. <clears throat> okay, this is a zero discharge system. We don't need to bring water back into the system. We're not talking about a lot of water because as I say, we only operate this uh, three to four times a day. So the water volume is minimal, All right? It's a little bit of a video here. Show the guys installing the units. They're drawn back and forth. This is some of the electrical gear being installed. Okay, this is this is actually operating right. Okay. This one's operating. This is a, a this is a single wide pump and water being pumped into the trough, as you can see. Okay. Now underneath this vacuum head, as you can see, this is what it looked like when we were working on this, building this in our shop originally. That's the vacuum head there. And underneath it has a zigzag pattern like this. So it will pick up solids, whether it's coming or going, so to speak. And uh, it makes it highly efficient as a waste removal or solids removal tool, you know, from the bottom of the raceway. Now you can see the working walkway there on the left, the quiescent zone. These things work very, very efficiently. Okay. Okay, as a, as a wrap up here, <clears throat> As I uh, said earlier on in the, in the presentation, uh, it's very important to do this right. It's, this is like uh, making any other investment. If it's uh, your home or a piece of machinery or a car, you wanna, you wanna get the most out of it for what you wanna, want from it and because the investment is significant. Don't use materials that you don't know about or, or that we're not talking about in this presentation. And remember uh, what I said early on, this is an introductory uh, presentation. If you want to learn more about it, you know, get with, with Dave, get with me, and we'll be happy to, to try to uh, uh, provide you with the, with the detailed information that you, that you need to make this uh, a successful uh, and profitable uh, investment for you. Uh, well, thanks everyone for your attention and uh, participating in this in this presentation. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to do this with with Dave uh, Klein and his group. Uh, they're making these uh, things available, you know, to a, a broad audience. Uh, glad to be able to do it. But remember, this is an introductory presentation. This does not uh, pretend to give you all the details that you need to make this investment successful. You need a lot more details. And this is just the, the primer, if you will, that will kind of allow you to say, well, okay, I, I would like to know more about this, more details about this, whether it's the, the machinery or installation or where do you get the gear, all of these things, you know, we can provide for you, but this is not really meant to do that for you today. But I was glad to be able to do it, glad to spend some time with you and uh, do get in touch with me or with Dave uh, he can provide that information for you so that we can provide additional information for you to link you up with folks in your part of the world, maybe that can help you directly. So thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you.